There are few groups as mysterious or influential as Kraftwerk. Formed in a Germany still very much in the shadow of the Second World War, Kraftwerk managed to invent new music, free of American influence, that sounded fresh, optimistic and ironic. In We Are the Robots, a BBC Radio 4 documentary which aired in 2007, Mark Riley tells the story of this extraordinary band with the help of former member Wolfgang Fleur and fans including Gary Newman, John Fox, The Smiths' Johnny Marr and writer Paul Morley. We'll hear about Kraftwerk's love of cycling, fondness for ice cream and hatred of piped music in hotels. Wolfgang Fleur also recalls turning down David Bowie's invitation to collaborate and how they substituted themselves with robot replicas on one tour so they could go on holiday. It's all part of the mystique of a band formed by two architecture students from Dusseldorf without whom modern music would sound very different. You're listening to Radio 4 on Music with me, John Wilson, and this is Kraftwerk, We Are The Robots. It was about 70 eight or so when I started to listen to them and I thought yeah that's that's it that's the sound of the future it's a completely different way of thinking it's a totally different approach to making music the first time they um, they ever struck me was um, when I saw them on tomorrow's world I think it said something like this is the future of music and I looked at these guys with these, you know, austere sort of haircuts and, and these um, weird overcoats and stuff. And at the time I thought, I hope not. We are the robots. We are the robots. We are the robots. Kraftwerk, perhaps more than any other band of the last 40 years, have instigated all forms of emotions in the listener. Intrigue, amusement, reverence, bewilderment. In their world, the everyday becomes the otherworldly. Neon lights, bicycle races, motorway networks, and the otherworldly becomes reality. A Germanic catalogue of landmark musical innovation and revolutionary invention. In 1969 and 20 years on, Germany was still licking its wounds after the cataclysmic act of self-destruction we called World War II. The Germans were, by and large, riddled with self-loathing or at least low self-esteem. They'd lost the war and with it their sense of pride and culture. Ralph Hutter and Florian Schneider were two students of architecture with a shared love of architecture, naturally, and the groundbreaking musical works of Karl Heinz Stockhausen. Classically trained musicians on a mission. Academic Dr David Robb. I think it's important where they came from. They came out of this underground movement of the late 60s, which was very experimental. I don't think there was an overtly political statement with Kraftwerk. It was linked to the political scene of the students who rejected the war in Vietnam, they rejected the, the entrenched conservatism of German society. And they were committed to doing something new, uh, to reflecting a new Germany. A new Germany was not... Uh, bound to the nationalistic past, it was not bound to conservatism, and this was reflected in the experimentalism of, of not just Kraftwerk, but the whole artistic scene in general. After a false start in the music business with their Tone Float LP, released under the banner of Organisation, Ralph and Florian formed Kraftwerk in 1970. Although initially an avant-garde enterprise, Kraftwerk was still working within the parameters of Americanized rock music. They used guitars and drums, but didn't resemble in any way a traditional guitar-led rock band. Watching from the distance of his own band, the Spirits of Sound, was future Kraftwerk member Wolfgang Fleur. Kraftwerk wanted to create an own and unique German music in the beginning of the 70s, as we all know. We had no real pop music scene then, you know, we had Schlager. Artists like Peter Krauss, who copied Elvis Presley, for instance, or singer Alexandra, whom I loved in my youth... Otherwise, we had the Bavarian folk music with Alphorn, Tuba, Accordion and the Sither. Kraftwerk wanted to sound German and bring something special to the world of music and to look German. Indeed, everything was perfectly created and developed since then. Musician John Fox. I think what Kraftwerk and the young avant-garde at that time decided to do was to say, OK, that's all interesting, but what can we make out of it from a German perspective that is unique? And they were beginning to have the first signs of a cultural confidence, in other words, to sound German and not be afraid of it. 
No, we were not afraid. We knew that we were completely different because we, we could read it in the newspapers, in the headlines. They even wrote, we are idiots or I mean, <laughs> a crazy uh, uh, Knöpfchendreher or what they said, you know. They were an expression of a modern intellectual avant-garde Germany. In the art scene, you had new German cinema and you had the new German electronic music with bands like Can and Neu and Tangerine Dream. There was a sense of distancing themselves from the American commercialization of the time and attempting to create something distinctive and a new hybrid musical form which uh, mixed uh, progressive rock with their uh, German experimentalism and this was very important. Kraftwerk were making a statement about society in general, about the increasing role of technology in our lives and their music reflected the rhythms of the motorway, of machines and industry and this was done by using computers and they were in fact the first band to use exclusively computers in their music. Journalist and broadcaster Paul Morley. You can imagine what they'd inherited. But of course, they were also very aware that in the rest of the world, popular culture was giving young people a voice. It was giving the idea of art and innovation a chance. They didn't want to be left behind simply because they'd inherited this awful um, catastrophe. And, and I think it's, 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 in a way, it's in the essence of their music that there is always a poignancy, there's always a kind of sadness. And I always felt that in the same way as the Beach Boys had kind of compressed America into a pop song, Kraftwerk, who indeed were inspired, oddly enough, by the Beach Boys, wanted to compress the best ideas of Germany, the ideas of Germany that they wanted to you know, recapture and, and rediscover and redistribute in, in, into the 20th century. They wanted to compress all of that into a pop song. <laughs> It's been said that the Rolling Stones' murderous Altamont gig of December 1969 killed off the peace and love movement of the 60s. But as one cultural door slammed shut, another was opening. The early 70s were, for the UK at least, a musical free-for-all. There was no single impressive musical force. Hippies were out, modern rockers had died a death, even the Beatles had imploded. Germany, though, was undergoing a healthy rejuvenation, albeit behind closed doors and to a minimal audience. This new movement was given a somewhat derogatory moniker of kraut rock. Paul Morley again. You could look at Faust and Cannes, and they were, it was very musical in the sense of it was uh, experimental almost on a a post-jazz level, a post-Stockhausen level, whereas Kraftwerk were, were, as much as they were musicians, were very definitely artists and in a way treated the making of music as art and it was as if the, the, the sounds they made was like their canvas. The first two Kraftwerk albums, Kraftwerk 1 and Kraftwerk 2, had set the foundations for the future. But by their third album, appropriately entitled Ralph und Florian, Kraftwerk had become an innovative, stripped-down two-piece outfit. The instruments they used were high-tech, the drums and guitars had been disposed of, and a newfound sense of purpose and melody was now taking a grip on the band. Ralph and Florian was an acceptably well-received album, but it was their next opus, 1974's Autobahn, that would introduce Kraftwerk to the world. Autobahn sounded like nothing else, but at the time it could easily have been dismissed as a novelty record. The funny thing about Kraftwerk is, is when you think of their... They're well-known songs like your autobahns and your your model and your your robots. They they have the they have all the quality of novelty hits, Bowie and Eno and others, John Fox, Ultravox, the Human League started to make that sound be what it was. That it was incredibly influential. That you should take it seriously. That that it was still valid just because it was made on machinery didn't make it any less emotional. To me, that. <laughs> They weren't really a proper band. Ex-Smiths guitarist and songwriter Johnny Marr. I didn't really take them that seriously uh, until David Bowie started talking about them in interviews and they started appearing as, um, you know, sort of cultural references. A, a lot of people in the mid to late 70s got a lot of their information from David Bowie. Thankfully, not everybody dismissed this brave new musical world. 
all popular music after Kraftwerk was made on machines, whether it sounded like it or, or not. That whole Eno, Bowie, Low Heroes period, uh, and, then, and then Iggy with The Idiot, started to make sense of Kraftwerk very early on. Iggy Pop was the enfant terrible of self-harm rock. His professional persona closer to that of a caged animal than to the intelligent clinical output of Kraftwerk. But it was Iggy, alongside his co-writer and producer David Bowie, who created the first big-selling homages to the now-expanded Kraftwerk. Florian Schneider and Ralph Hutter, drummer Wolfgang Fleur and Karl Bartos. The respect was mutual. So why then did the four young men turn down an invitation from Bowie to join him on tour? Uh, what can I say? We admired him very much and uh, he is in, in, in one of our lyrics. I mean, meet David Bowie and Iggy Pop and so that was in Trans Europe Express, you remember. But Ralph and Florian said no, they decided other because they wanted to stay unique and self-referred to, to Kraftwerk and absolutely no mix with other music styles and cultures, you know. To turn down the offer of collaborating with David Bowie at his creative peak was not only a brave move, surprisingly it was also a very astute one. The Kraftwerk myth was expanding. Their austere, business-like attitude to recording and touring had, by this time, taken them from their perceived role as quirky outsiders to a new heralded place, and their influence on the next generation of million-selling pop stars was about to take hold. From the Human League, Martin Ware. The real turning point for me in terms of my kind of epiphanal moment, if you like, was uh, I was friends with Cabaret Voltaire, and one summer, and I can't remember what year it was, but I think it might have been 75, Richard Kirk from Cabaret Voltaire had a party at his parents' house. I don't know where he got it from, but he, he actually had a huge PA system in the back garden. And that was the first time that I heard uh, Trans Europe Express. But if you can imagine, Trans Europe Express played on a huge PA system, almost like a dub system. He actually, to me, sounded about the same volume as a huge express train coming past. I perceived electronic music in an entirely different way for the first time, which is much more visceral, much more affecting uh, in, in a kind of physical way. And all of a sudden it all clicked into place for me and uh, from that moment on I wanted to be uh, an electronic musician. Musician Gary Newman. I, I looked to what they were doing as um, a shining light really as to how to think differently about putting music together completely different to anything that's been done before and so that makes you think differently yourself and so now you go to the studio to do your album and you're not thinking about we need to have drums here or guitar there whatever it is you, you there's all this other stuff that you can do you know, I hate to When I found the Mini Moog and pressed a key in it, the room shook with the power of it. I thought, that's it. That's exactly what I'm after. A much welcomed antidote to the hysterical, banal, and often vacuous cliches of mid 70s UK pop, lest we forget the Bay City Rollers were amongst the main players of this era, Kraftwerk's sterile yet emotive music was impossible to ignore, and equally impossible to dissect, for perhaps anyone but a member of Kraftwerk. In this archive clip, Ralph Hutter shed some light on his band's influences and agenda. We live in Düsseldorf, the industrial district of Germany, so uh, our music is also very uh, environmental, and so we have these noises of um, cars, cities, urban, um, everyday life noises in our music, and this is a reflection of our everyday experience. Well, that clears that up. 
Wolfgang Fleur, though, admits to being more than a little surprised that their product was proving to be so influential and much copied. We were too different and too um, complicated in our themes and in our music that we, we couldn't believe that we become so big, you know, that we can change the whole pop music genre, you know, in, in, into a style, into an electronic style which is copied so much and so developed so much other styles. So, the magic formula finally reveals itself. A startlingly inventive new form of music, instigated by the aftermath of a failed war, fueled by nationalism, and executed with electronic gadgets. As the Kraftwerk story unfolds, it becomes apparent that this isn't merely the story of an inventive pop group with a deep love of the bicycle. It's also the story of a mindset, a philosophy, a cultural statement... A master plan. Because effectively they want to have a real impact on the appearance and the sound of the world itself, then they take it very seriously. Within that there are jokes and there are secret codes and all sorts of satires and parodies, but the, the thing itself is, is incredibly serious. Everything they did and everything they communicated and everything that appeared from that strange module, wherever it was, you know, was completely sorted out. It was numbered, it was coded, it never cracked, you never saw inside. And especially when it started to become more robotic and they really started to enjoy the idea that they were perceived as robots. You know, you just got the feeling that at the centre of it, if you ever went there, they really were just robots, that there were no human beings. Ah, the robots. Perhaps the ultimate in-joke. Perhaps the ultimate pop-art statement. Perhaps a great way of getting out of doing some hard work. Realised when a holiday in Kraftwerk sent the robots to perform a series of eight concerts taking place in major cities throughout Europe. The thing is, no one seemed to mind. One, two, three, four... development from the uh, from the dolls the showroom dummies later it was the model and then it was the robots you know but first showroom dummies was a very early song and we had already original showroom dummies from a big storehouse which we clothed in, in suits and we made the first little films with it and it was very funny and over the years, I mean, the idea developed more and more to make that more perfectly, you know. And then we have let made uh, our heads and faces from a uh, Bavarian artist who uh, made them in, in plastic, you know, and we, we closed them in the famous red hats and uh, black trouser and tie, you know, as everybody knows. And this was a development over many years, you know, until the final robot theme was on and became so big. Of course, the now famous robots were more than capable of fronting the increasingly elusive band entity on stage. But only the four musical boffins could actually write Kraftwerk material. And this they did, routine like, in their legendary Kling Klang studios in Dusseldorf. Wolfgang explains a typical Kraftwerk working day. In the Kling Klang studio of my time, we met up every evening around 7 or 8. Then we watched mostly TV news. After it, we drank mostly coffee or went for an ice cream, a nearby ice cream shop. And then we went to the next room, which I call the rehearsal room, the Kling Klang. And we made some Klang or Kling. It depended how we felt. Someone came up with a headline maybe of a newspaper, for instance, or maybe a TV report. Then some uh, melody was played around that theme. It developed over the following days, more and more lyrics came up, rhymes as well, and last not least, a rhythm was drummed. That's how it worked. Johnny Marr spent many months in the company of Kraftwerk's Carl Bartos when they collaborated on the second electronic LP, Raise the Pressure. Both Johnny and bandmate Bernard Sumner, also of New Order, were huge Kraftwerk admirers, excited at the prospect of working with Carl, 
and intrigued as to what bizarre work ethic and strange academic qualities he would bring to the creative process. We had this idea that um, what was going to happen then, this was 1995, 96, that because it, it was one of Kraftwerk and we were going to do this thing and it was all technology-based, we just assumed that he would always wore a white lab coat, obviously, and um, that he would maybe program some beats in his, in his kind of bunker high-tech studio and then send them down the phone line as it was then. And then we put them in our computers and then we'd work on them and then, you know, I'd play guitar on them and Bernard would uh, I'd sing on them. And in fact, we had a conversation with Carl and he invited us over to Dusseldorf where Kraftwerk lived at that time. So we went over We went over there and he met us in his beat-up old car and um, not on a push bike. Carl is a very, very passionate and very capable musician and is a working musician. That was the thing that struck us. Is there a stern cloud of mystique an attempt to make themselves seem more interesting? Or are Kraftwerk, as presented, a truly visionary art cooperative, genuinely ill at ease with the world around them? Everybody's who's been near him has got these amazing stories how when they used to go around hotels they'd keep wire cutters with them to, and they'd just literally cut the wires that go at the speakers if uh, if what they considered to be noise pollution was, was in the air. Another form of noise pollution is the phone ringing. That's right, yeah. Ralph Hutter and the, the phone. Um, I, I'd been told that if you wanted to call him you had to call him right on the dot of say four o'clock if you'd arranged it and he <laughs> had the the bells taken out of his phone and he'd just wait until the absolute four o'clock on the dot and then he'd pick up the phone and say hello <laughs> which is so brilliant but what was the motivation their intentions were they sincere was craft work an in-joke I always thought they were they were a lot funnier than than people thought. I I often consider them to be possibly you know the funniest Germans of all time. You know they were comedians and satirists as much as anything else. I don't know if you've heard this about the band turning up to a nightclub and at one point um, there's a James Brown tune comes on and they all look at each other all in the suits and pristine and they all get up uh, together in a line and do this synchronised dance to a James Brown tune. Have you heard that story? I have and it's one of the many anecdotes about craft work that m makes you want to weep with joy and wonder. And I love that, you know, embedded in that story is the whole idea that you really want from your very favourite pop groups that they travel as a four-piece. True or not, they travel as a four-piece in their stage clothes and act out the whole thing. Is this a true story? Yes, it is. Yes, I mean, we dance a little bit. We were not very good dancers, you know. We were a little bit stiff, you know. And, I mean, that was, that was also humour and ironic when we danced. And sometimes we met friends or other artists like Ian Dury in, in a club in Venice and we danced together. He stood on my feet, you know. <laughs> I danced him, you know. Kraftwerk's mission, it would seem, was to not only change the face of popular music, which they did, but to also instill a sense of national pride, lost following the demise and ensuing shame brought about by the Hitler regime. Not overly ambitious, then. But how much did humour play a part in the Kraftwerk ethos? It was all ironic, you know. It was more than ironic. It was full of humour. But people had to, uh, to, to find that out, you know. So, who exactly were Kraftwerk? Were they four overly serious intellectual musicians with a heavyweight political plan? Or were they just four mischievous, dance-loving young men from Dusseldorf playing a calculated game of cat and mouse with the record-buying public? Paul Morley again. Scratch beneath the surface of all Kraftwerkian um, antics and they are saying something other than what it appears. And absolutely the idea of Kraftwerk and the idea of Autobahn is a comment on the Germanic nature Craftwork were responding in all sorts of very imaginative, very discreet, very subversive ways to what had happened to Germany in the 20th century. Craftwork's influence on modern music since their inception in 1970 cannot be underestimated. That they played an integral part in the emergence of the dance and rave culture is both obvious and irrefutable. That they were major players in the invention of hip-hop is probably not so well known, and the fact that they were, in 1971, Seemingly the first band to use a drum machine is cemented in history. But why bother? 
What was wrong with a good old-fashioned tub-thumping percussionist? Well, the most important thing for us was always uh, the rhythms. The biggest problem we always had was with drummers, because they were very much into the whole physical thing of gymnastics, you know. So, so we changed, I, I think every drummer who came to play with us from the area where we live, we had about 20 different, and they wouldn't stay with us because we asked them to electrify, you know, to get get away from this physical um, thing into electrical sound. They wouldn't do it, so one day we found ourselves standing there on our own, just the two of us, Ralph Florian, as we were. And I just happened to have an old uh, rhythm box machine. So we started recording with that in 1971, and from that day on there was no, no turning back. When Wolfgang came in, he was the first uh, to really be open enough to play. It's interesting what happened in America when all those kids in New York and Detroit got hold of drum machines. John Fox. Drum machines were a result of an, another sort of parallel evolution, really. It was something to do with craft work, but not completely. Uh, they came from Japan. And when pop musicians began to use those instruments, the Japanese quickly decided to invent a more powerful version. And then a lot of kids in clubs started using them to rap to. So that began to evolve as a, as a form, almost independently. And it was when people like Africa Bombata united the two with Planet Rock. That's when it really took off. The musical aspect of uh, hip-hop was really uh, kind of set in stone with Planet Rock. Kraftwerk not only changed the beat, they changed the sound and they changed the machines also and the technique. And, um, yeah, I don't really think anybody else has done that. So far, so good. Kraftwerk had gone from being underground outsiders to worship to mimic trailblazers by wannabe musicians from all walks of life. So where exactly did the master plan falter? Could it have really been the humble bicycle that was to prove to be their undoing? An unlikely but growing obsession with riding bikes, see Tour de France, was increasingly distracting Ralph and Florian from their musical duties. Cue a disgruntled Wolfgang. I left the band, I had to, because of a lack to, dis to distinguish the difference between the importance of a synthesizer and the 12 gear transmission of a racing bike. There is no, no development in Kraftwerk, so that would have been interesting to me if I hear some one single new song after Tour de France, you know. Wolfgang does have a point. Kraftwerk haven't made a new record since Electric Café in 1986. So, where to now? Where to now of Kraftwerk, in a way, has been a sad where to now for quite a while, and that's the problem with something that was so innovative in a very particular period of time. It's almost like they predicted a world so accurately and so brilliantly that when that world arrived, there was really nowhere for them to go. Because I think they just, in a, in a very brief period of time, fundamentally did it all. <laughs> 